Uh, thank you, uh, Jerry, very much for inviting me and HPA for inviting me to speak at this symposium today. It's just wonderful to see how this conference has evolved um, and uh, great to have all the, the attendees here today. I'm gonna be speaking uh, briefly about promising new treatments for preventing or slowing the progression of Parkinson's disease, uh, as well as uh, talking about uh, a new test, a skin test that might be available soon for diagnosing Parkinson's disease. I really have no uh, financial relationships with commercial interests. Um, I, I, for me, the most important research questions in Parkinson's disease uh, are really based on three facts. One is uh, we still don't know the cause of Parkinson's disease. Two is while we are pretty good at making a diagnosis using our clinical judgment, there is no diagnostic test. So we're wrong about 15% of the time. And three, is while we have excellent medications to treat the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, in particular the motor symptoms, we don't really have interventions yet to cure Parkinson's disease or slow or halt the progression of Parkinson's disease. So my talk today will kind of focus on new information on a diagnostic tests, as well as um, an update of some of the uh, exciting research that's being done in disease modification. So um, the, uh, the discussion of this diagnostic test is a great illustration of how a simple observation by an astute person can lead to a really important scientific discovery. So this uh, starts back in the 1990s when a wife in England noticed uh, when her husband came home from work one day that his body odor had changed to a very woody or musky smell. And she accused him of not bathing. And he said, oh no, I bathe every day, just the same as always, but this smell persisted. And about uh, uh, several months later, he developed Parkinson's disease and later on, she noticed the same odor in others with Parkinson's disease. So um, fast forward to 2012, she and her husband attended uh, a, a conference of Parkinson's disease that was being, uh, that was sponsored by an internationally known researcher. And at the end of his presentation, she asked the question, why is it that people with Parkinson's disease smell different than others? Well, this was kind of shocking to him. He had no, no idea. And what it led to was a collaboration between this researcher uh, and uh, this uh, nurse who was the wife of this uh, person with Parkinson's disease to try to sort out uh, what this odor was about in people that she recognized who had Parkinson's disease. So what he did was he got six people with Parkinson's disease and he got six unaffected individuals. and he. Um, collected their t-shirts, he tore them up, and he exposed those t-shirts to, uh, to the wife. And she was able to uh, identify 11 out of 12 uh, uh, correct diagnoses among those uh, 12 different t-shirts. And the fascinating thing is that the 12th individual was later diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So her record was actually 12 out of 12. Well, this was astonishing. So this set the researcher to try to figure out what it was about the odor, uh, the, what it was that caused this odor. And it was traced to sebum. And you all know that sebum is the oily waxy matter in skin uh, that's secreted to lubricate and waterproof our skin. And in fact, we, it's been known for years that people with Parkinson's disease um, have an excess secretion of sebum and oftentimes have a seborrheic dermatitis. So um, what it, this led to was uh, the identification of a profile of compounds in sebum that had been identified as being involved in the odor. And these can be measured in skin swabs to determine the presence of Parkinson's disease. So uh, the investigator actually designed another study with 100 individuals with Parkinson's disease and 29 individuals who were unaffected by Parkinson's disease. And he did skin tests on all of them 
and he was able to correctly classify 84% of these individuals. So why is this important? Well, obviously it's important uh, to have a diagnostic test to be able to confirm our clinical diagnosis, but maybe even more important than that is uh, the ability to perhaps make a diagnosis months, if not years, prior to the development of motor features of Parkinson's disease that allow a clinical diagnosis. So the idea would be that you would identify these individuals and then enroll them in clinical trials of medications that might be designed to slow down the progression of Parkinson's disease, um, or at least, uh, or or at least, uh, uh, if not stop the progression, slow down the progression. So this is a really exciting development, and I think we'll be seeing more of it in the near future. So moving now to disease-modifying therapies, uh, what I'm talking about here is really a cure. And to have a cure for Parkinson's disease, there are three things really that need to happen. One is to have a way to stop the disease process. Two is a way to protect surviving nerve cells. And three is a way to restore or replace the cells that have already been lost. And there's a lot of progress being made in each one of these three strategies. And I'll talk a little bit about each area. So to start with, stopping disease progression. So one of the ways that we think that uh, cells or nerve cells may be lost in Parkinson's disease is through the deposition of a protein called alpha-synuclein, and in particular, a toxic form of this protein. And as you all know, it's the presence of alpha-synuclein in Lewy bodies in nerve cells in the brains of people with Parkinson's disease that allow us to make uh, a post-mortem confirmation of the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. So um, immunotherapies have been developed that use antibodies to target alpha-synuclein and remove it from these cells. And in particular, a recent study, the Pasadena study, uh, has, uh, ha has developed a synuclein targeting immunotherapy called prozinezumab, and results have just recently uh, been uh, published from a phase two trial. And you remember that phase two trials are trials that usually enroll small numbers of individuals uh, that and, and, the, and the point of the trial is to look at safety of the proposed uh, intervention as well as uh, efficacy. So uh, the, this trial did not meet the primary efficacy endpoint. However, there were signals of efficacy in the secondary or alternative endpoints. And in particular, one of these endpoints was change in the score of the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale Motor Score. And, as, and most of you probably are familiar with uh, the UPDRS being the way that we rate uh, motor features of Parkinson's disease and rate progression. So based on these UPDS motor scores, uh, there was slower progression in those treated with this immunotherapy versus those on placebo. So um, phase three trials are going to be developed soon, hopefully. And in fact, there are several different sorts of uh, alpha-synuclein uh, immunotherapies that are um, being developed. And there's another study called the SPARC study that is, has a phase two trial that's ongoing right now. So moving now to interventions that um, protect nerve cells. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about two uh, medications that have been repurposed for uh, protecting nerve cells in people with Parkinson's disease. And the first one of these is, is ratapine. And is ratapine uh, is an appro approved blood pressure medication that blocks calcium channels. Now channels are gateways into cells that allow certain chemicals in and cer certain chemicals out to enhance nerve uh, functions. And cells use calcium channels and uh, sodium channels and other types of channels. And in particular, the nerve cells in the substantia nigra, which you recall is the part of the brain that's affected in Parkinson's disease, use calcium and sodium channels uh, for normal functioning. The problem is that calcium 
can actually be harmful to the cell and can some, in some instances lead to cell death. So we know that blocking these calcium channels uh, can be helpful uh, to the cell uh, and improve survival. And in particular, using isratapine to block calcium channels in animal models of Parkinson's disease has shown to be a neuroprotective in these uh, animal models. So this uh, eventually led to a phase three trial and phase three trials are efficacy trials. They are the definitive trials that look for uh, effectiveness of the intervention. And results of a phase three trial that was published in 2019, unfortunately showed no significant benefit. And some of you in the audience may have actually participated uh, in this study because we were fortunate to be one of the sites uh, for this isratapine study. So the results initially were somewhat disappointing. However, the investigators in this trial actually have uh, reanalyzed the data and they started to examine these, the study outcomes among participants in the trial who had the highest blood levels of isratapine, meaning individuals who had the greatest exposure to isratapine. And what they were able to show was that higher isratapine exposure was associated with delay in need for treatment of Parkinson's disease and a lower dose of levodopa at the start of treatment suggesting that uh, actually high levels of exposure to isratapine may be neuroprotective. The second medication I wanna talk about is exenatide. And exenatide is an approved medication to treat diabetes. It inhibits cell death, reduces inflammation, and reduces oxidative stress, which is one of the, uh, the pathways to cell injury and cell death that we think take place in Parkinson's disease. Now, there have been multiple studies that suggest neuroprotective properties of exenatide in animal models of Parkinson's disease. And in 2017, another phase two exenatide trial reported the stabilization of Parkinson's disease motor features over the course of the 48-week trial. And importantly, these improvements remained after the treatment was stopped for three months. So in the bottom right-hand um, side of this slide, you'll see a figure that shows um, the change in UPDRS scores in the placebo, which is the red line, versus exenatide, which is the blue line. And you see with the placebo, the scores get worse over time, over the 60 months of the trial. Whereas with the exenatide, the UPDRS scores actually improve and stabilize uh, over time, suggesting that exenatide may be neuroprotective. Um, there is a phase three trial that is ongoing. And in fact, others have uh, designed compounds in this same class that have similar effects to exenatide. And these are also being tested. So this is another really exciting uh, area of research. So the third component of a cure is nerve cell restoration. And there are a couple of ways or strategies for accomplishing this. One is uh, stem cell transplantation and two are regenerative approaches. That is actually um, uh, either um, regenerating cells that have been injured or, or uh, destroyed or converting existing cells that have a different um, functions to turn into cells that, uh, that are the cells of interest. And so I'll talk about a little bit about both of these. To start out with, um, I want to talk about the regenerative uh, research. So we know that the brain is made up basically of two kinds of cells. One of the cells are the neurons or nerve cells, and these are the key information messengers in the brain. Most of the neurons in the brain are present at birth, and these cannot be replaced. And so it's the dopamine producing neurons uh, that are injured uh, in Parkinson's disease and lead to the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Glial cells, on the other hand, are support cells. And there are three different kinds. Microglia are involved in inflammation. Oligodendrocytes are involved in the myelin covering of nerve cell processes. 
And astrocytes are the type of glial cells that provide nutrients and assure a healthy environment. And interestingly, in the, in the last decade or so, researchers have learned to convert astrocytes into dopamine producing nerve cells by reducing the levels of a, of a particular protein called PTBP1. And these functioning dopamine producing neurons are able to send new fibers into the striatum, which is the target area of dopamine neurons. And uh, in laboratory animals, uh, when these animals are injected uh, with, with um, this protein. So this has led to a lot of research uh, on converting uh, astrocytes into dopamine producing neurons in laboratory animals. So how is this done? Well, the first step is um, a virus is programmed to reduce PTBP1 in astrocytes. And then this virus is injected into the mouse brain. And once it's in the mouse brain, the virus infects uh, astrocytes. And it's been shown that 80% of these infected cells act like uh, dopamine producing nerve cells. So the next step is to test the ability of these astrocyte derived dopamine producing neurons to reverse Parkinsonian features in a mouse model of Parkinson's disease. So this has been done recently and published within the last year or two. And in this model, a toxin is injected that destroys dopamine producing nerve cells in the animal leading to Parkinsonism and all the motor features of Parkinsonism in this animal. And then the virus programmed to decrease PTBP1 and convert astrocytes into dopamine neurons is injected into that laboratory animal. And then uh, over time, the number of dopamine producing nerve cells is measured through imaging. So in this um, uh, picture on the left, what you see here in the left side of the panel with the green, the green is the unaffected side. It has not been injected with the toxin. So these are normal uh, dopamine cells. On the right-hand side uh, is the side that's been injected with the toxin. It completely wipes out the dopamine producing nerve cells on this side of the brain. So in the top panel here, uh, this affected side is injected with an empty virus. That is the virus does not have uh, the uh, is not, has not been protein programmed to decrease PTBP1. And what you see is a persistence in the absence of dopamine producing neurons here. On the other hand, in the lower panel, what you see is the brain from an animal where the virus programmed to decrease PTBP1 results in increased numbers of dopamine neurons and increased release of dopamine in the putamen. And these increased amounts of dopamine were actually enough to, con to correct the Parkinsonian symptoms in the mouse model. So this is really quite exciting, but it's gonna be a while before we can see this in human trials. There has to be validation in other animal models of Parkinson's disease, as well as in older rodents in future experiments. And there has to be a feasibility and dosing studies in non-human primates to determine if it's possible to turn astrocytes into nerve cells, particularly dopamine producing nerve cells in the aged primate brain. So lastly, I'll turn to stem cell therapy. Stem cells are unspecialized cells that can bind and differentiate into many different types of specialized cells. There are, are several different types of uh, stem cells. Probably most of us are familiar with embryonic stem cells. These are uh, from fertilized human embryos. These have fallen out of favor for many different reasons. They're hard to get, and plus um, they're controversial for obvious reasons. So the type of stem cell that's being used in Parkinson's disease now is what's called an induced pluripotent stem cell. And these are usually derived from human skin and they are reprogrammed to have the capability to differentiate into multiple different cell types, including dopamine producing cells. So uh, I think it's very exciting news to learn that the first in-human clinical trial using induced pluripotent stem cells from human skin cells 
programmed to mature into dopamine producing neurons has already started. It began in Japan in August of 2018. It is a phase one slash two study to evaluate safety as well as efficacy. All the subjects enrolled are, will be from Japan and induced pluripotent stem cells transplanted will be trans, are transplanted into the left and right putamen of seven subjects. So results are pending, but uh, I, I expect they'll be out within the next uh, year. And uh, future trials with uh, induced pluripotent stem cells are being planned soon in North America. Now, some of you may have read uh, in the New England Journal and in the news about a year ago now about a single case report um, of implanted pluripotent stem cells in a single uh, individual with Parkinson's disease. So this was kind of an unusual uh, case report, an unusual study. It was conducted under regulatory guidance of the Food and Drug Administration under an individual patient expanded access. Uh, and it was reviewed by an institutional review board uh, at the Massachusetts General Hospital. The individual was a 69 year old gentleman with a 10 year history of Parkinson's disease. And he underwent two MRI scan guided procedures to implant the cells in the left putamen and then the right putamen six months later. Now these pluripotent stem cells came from his own skin. So there was no requirement for immunosuppressant medications. So um, at 24 months after the initial implantation, the patient had had no uh, adverse effects and no decline in function. If you look at this top panel, um, this is uh, the months since first you know, implantation on the bottom and uh, UPDRS motor scores on the side. And what you see in the red is the off state and in the blue is the on state. And so after the first injection, there's actually an improvement in both the on and off state that kind of return toward uh, baseline. Uh, and then with the second injection, sort of a stabilization, both in terms of the off and the on state. So there were no dyskinesias or, adver uh, or serious adverse effects in the patient. And uh, the patient actually had um, a one less hour of off time per day, which was, uh, which was um, uh, exciting. The other thing was that uh, his quality of life improved. And the bottom panel shows the score of, of quality of life on the Parkinson's disease questionnaire. And um, the baseline score was 60. And at month uh, 24, it was uh, close to, to zero. So there was a, a vast improvement in quality of life. There are a couple of important caveats here. First of all, this was an open trial, meaning the patient knew uh, that he was getting the actual treatment. And both patient and raters were aware of the intervention. So there could have been a potential for bias in rating the, the uh, individual's uh, uh, motor function and the individual could have been susceptible to bias in rating his own quality of life. So we really need to uh, wait for some of these more definitive controlled trials that are taking place now before we can make a final uh, decision about the efficacy of stem cells. So if you're interested in more information in this area, here are some <clears throat> resources that you can go to. In, in particular, um, Fox Foundation, Mar National Parkinson Foundation, and then this website, The Science of Parkinson's Disease, I think is really informative. So I'll stop there and open it up for questions. Thank you for your attention. And once again, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you.